So we saw that the equilibrium constant tells us uh, what the composition of the reaction will mixture will be at the at the end point, basically when we when, once we've reached equilibrium. So we might wonder how equilibrium is affected by temperature, and we can figure out how this uh, works by just by writing down the equation we talked about last time, which is that the standard Gibbs energy delta G standard is negative R T times the log of K equilibrium. And remembering that, oh, okay, we could break down delta G standard into two pieces. Delta H standard minus T delta S standard. And uh, then we can equate these two. Say delta H minus T delta S. That's of course for a chemical reaction is equal to negative RT log of K. So we can divide by negative RT. So we've got delta H for negative RT plus delta S over R is equal to the log of K. So we could rewrite this, let's just rewrite this a little bit. I'll put the log on the left hand side, log k q. That's supposed to be q. Is equal to we could say delta h over r times 1 over t plus delta S over R. When we write it this way, we can see we could call this Y, this M, this X, and this B. And so if delta S for the reaction and delta H for the reaction are constant over the temperature range of interest, we can see that if we graph the, uh, if we graph 1 over t as our x, and the log of the equilibrium constant is y, that the slope of that will give us the negative over delta h over r. So let's draw, let's draw that on the next page. So this implies we can just graph that, right? We can measure the equilibrium constant at a bunch of different temperatures and plot it. And so for instance, if we got data that looked like this, we can say, okay, the slope is equal to negative delta H over R. Let's think about this for a second. Uh, well, this is implying that if we go to a very high temperature, remember a high temperature would be over here because this is a reciprocal temperature axis here on the x-axis. So if we go to a high temperature, we've got a large equilibrium constant. And if we go to lower temperature over here, we have a smaller equilibrium constant. And so this reaction basically uh, gives us better, a better yield at equilibrium at, at uh, higher temperatures. Well, if we look at this, uh, the slope is a negative number. And the slope is negative delta H over R. So this implies that uh, delta H must be a uh, a positive number. In other words, it's an endothermic reaction, so we have a positive number here times a negative will give us a negative slope. So this this particular reaction that we're looking at must be endothermic. Now if we have an endothermic reaction and we raise the temperature, we talked about this a little bit in general chemistry, it's almost like Le Chatelier's principle. If it's endothermic, you can think of heat as being a reactant, right? Heat's something that's absorbed by the reaction, uh, it's something that you put in. And so if, it's, if heat's a reactant, you expect that maybe raising the temperature is going to shift the equilibrium to the right, towards products. And indeed, we can see that if we go to an X value over here that is a, a, a high temperature, right, this is going to give us a big equilibrium constant. 
So endothermic reactions have an equilibrium constant that gets bigger if we, if we go to very high temperatures, which is over here. So this is just as we'd expect. Conversely, if we have an exothermic reaction, we'd get data that look like this. So here, we still have a slope that's equal to negative delta H over R. But here, because this is a positive number, and there's a negative sign here, we must know that it must be that delta H is negative, right? Which makes sense, right? We just said this was exothermic. And if we have an exothermic reaction, we would have predicted in general chemistry that we'd get a bigger equilibrium constant uh, at, at low temperatures, right? Because uh, an exothermic reaction, you can sort of think of heat as being a, as being a product. And so um, we expect that lower temperatures would favor the, a bigger equilibrium constant. And lower temperatures on this reciprocal axis are over here, and you can see, oh, look, that's a, that's a high equilibrium constant over here at, at low temperatures. So this all makes sense. So you can sort of use your knowledge of Le Chatelet's principle to make sure you're getting the sine rate on this equation. And this equation uh, is uh, called the Van Hoff equation. And so this is called a Van Hoff plot. When you plot the equilibrium constant as a function, uh, the log of the equilibrium constant as a function of reciprocal temperature. And so this is a nice way to figure out the delta H of a reaction without using any kind of calorimetry. All you have to do is measure the equilibrium constant at a bunch of different, different temperatures. And finally, this idea of the slope uh, being related to this type of uh, plot a little bit differently. We could say, we said earlier the slope is equal to delta H over R. And this is the slope on a, on a plot log of K 1 over T. So another way of saying this is that if we take the derivative of the log of K, with respect to 1 over t, and you're doing this all under standard conditions, so that's at one bar, so this is a constant pressure, this is going to be equal to negative delta h over r. And so this tells us if we take a slope on here, even if the data aren't perfectly linear, at any point on there, if we drew a tangent and figured out the slope, we could say, oh, at that particular temperature, the slope here is equal to some number, and from that we could back out the delta H. So we can actually use the Van Hoff equation to figure out delta H, even if the data aren't totally linear.